So um, now I want to go into the low input grassland scorecard in detail. Uh, so this is important. Um, now this is the basis of what you will do when you go to each field. Um, well, we'll talk about the multi-species lays tomorrow, um, but we'll talk about the, this is the low input grassland in detail. Um, as well as, as this talk that we've made, um, made a short video, about a 10 minute video um, on me uh, using the low input grassland scorecard, and that's going to be available. Uh, I think we'll probably show that tomorrow and that'll be available online then after that too. Um, yeah, and I think you, you're all a little bit familiar with, with um, you. hopefully that you have, um, that you've printed out the scorecards uh to to it'll just it'll just help you to to um to understand a little bit more um as i go through each question on the scorecard but if you haven't don't worry too much about it it doesn't it's not um it's not completely necessary and uh, we will be sending you in the post next week we have the scorecards in the office ready to, to send to you we've got card versions um so we'll send you score, um, the card versions of the two scorecards in the post next week but what we'll do is we're waiting for the um that species identification guides the plant identification the identification key it's called that's um that's with the publishers no yeah it's with the printing people at the moment so it's um it takes it's it's taking up to a couple of weeks to print that and we're nearly finished that that two week period now waiting for that to print so we'll have that we're expecting that this week in Johnstown Castle and we'll get both things into the post to you next week uh, to the farm advisors who have um, who have clients registered for a reap and we're also sending each farmer who um, has been approved into the program will also get one of these plant identification key books too. Okay. Um, so. Um, really important to reiterate this, how to choose a suitable field. So it's any enclosed field that receives low inputs of chemical and organic nitrogen fertilizer and could be a pasture or a meadow. And it must have a minimum of two non-grass indicator species, for example, common knapweed, you saw that in the last presentation, or a common sorrel, that's just two of them, and uh, must have a low cover of ryegrass under 30%. Now, I, I know I've said to you before, but um, that's the two non-grass indicator species. That doesn't mean to anything that's not grass, like uh, a bit of duck or a bit of chickweed or a daisy or a buttercup. It, it doesn't. It has to be an indicator species from, from the grassland scorecard and they're all listed on it. Um, fields must be predominantly grass and not contain heather and unwanted weeds um, should be controlled using mechanical means or by spot spraying. Ryegrass wards are ineligible to come into reap. They won't um, uh, well, they, they won't score on the scorecard anyway. Even if, if they were put in, they wouldn't receive a payable score. So um, I've showed you these before uh, as well as to, to, to recap. But um, so uh, before in the last presentation, I just showed you um, a semi-natural field that was little altered um, for agriculture, maybe just a little bit of grazing or whatever on it. This is a little bit more semi-improved. It's further along the continuum towards improved. And this is exactly what we're um, paying on in REAP. So it's everything, we're, everything in REAP we're paying on from semi-improved all the way up to semi-natural. And um, you know, if a field isn't incredibly isn't incredibly species rich, as uh, we as I showed earlier, well, there's still an opportunity then for farmers to to um, to gain points to putting fenced margins in the field. Um, if we didn't put that opportunity for people to get to fenced margins in the field, and we we're just scoring a species richness, well, the scores may not be that high. We're aware of that for everybody. So this, you can see some um, some diversity of, of flowers throughout this ward there. Another example of a semi-improved field that may have, um, maybe species rich or maybe species medium um, or maybe species poor, that all depends on how much fertilizer has been put on it. Um, you know, rush pasture um, typically can be very species rich and uh, provide lots of niches and habitats for lots of uh, insects and uh, invertebrates and amphibians too. Uh, but if, 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 it's, if, it's, if it's heavily managed, um, that we know that we'll lose those species. And this is a, the semi-natural field, which is as good quality as the one I showed before. Now, just in case you have the grassland scorecard there in front of you and you're thinking, oh God, this looks really, really scary. And um, it isn't, you know, it's, or, or hopefully you're thinking that it's easy. 
it, but I do, we do recognize that there's a bit of learning in it, okay, and this is new for everybody and it's you know, people that to have worked on maybe some of the results-based, uh, other results-based projects will be more familiar with how to use scorecards, but a lot of you here today haven't used them before and we know that this is, that, that it's, it's a little bit intimidating and particularly when we're having to do this training um, in this format online and not be able to take you out into the field and as we'd like to do to, to help to, to show you um, some of these things in a bit more detail. But we have tried to um, provide as many training aids as we can and um, um, you know that we think that if you do put in we, we do realize that you know that you, you are going to have to put in a little bit of effort it's uh you know that it's not going to come without doing a little bit a little bit of extra um on your own and trying to familiarize yourself with these species and you can do that through the various means including the plant identification key um and but but just this this slide i suppose is to is to show you just how simple the card is because the grasslands part of the scorecard has only got these questions on it. These are six questions. There's nine questions on the scorecard in total, but three of them are related to the boundary and the margins in the field. Um, today, we were, um, this talk is concentrating on the grassland questions in the card. So there's three questions that will give marks to the farmer, which are those first three, which is how many positive indicator species are found in this ward, and what is the cover of those, and the vegetation structure in the field. The next three questions then they take away um, marks or potentially take away marks if there's anything, if there's any damaging activities. I mean, um, we can't, if, if a field was uh, very species rich but there was an obvious um, sedimentation issue or poaching issue into a watercourse in the field, well, then that has to be. Um, that has to be acknowledged in the scorecard too. So there's um, the marks will be taken off there, but then in, in year two, that those marks could be quickly regained by the farmer through changing those practices. So um, using the, the LIG scorecard, and um, I know this is going back to basics, but I know from years going out to doing um, surveys in fields that uh, uh, there's nothing worse than getting to it, driving half an hour to get to a field and you're at the field and you think you're sure that you've got brought everything from the office with you and you're rushing out of the office to try to get there and, um, and you think you've got everything and you realize that you haven't got something fundamental that you need for it so it's handy to have this and this these um, presentations uh, this should be used as a um, as a resource there's lots of information in here that will help you um, as 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 your um, going forward and to refer to what is needed but there's a list of things that you need so print a map of the field a pens and a marker your agri snap app and download it onto your phone a clipboard paper scorecards so those paper scorecards that you've got now today that um that you would print off one of those for each field um you only need the front of it you don't need the guidance on the back but you print off one of those for each field before you go out scoring and a card score card that you receive in the post next week that's the front and the back on it and the back i suppose is the important bit but you don't want to be writing on those grass on those card uh, scorecards because you'll ruin them obviously and you just want to keep um, the writing to the paper ones and your plant identification key book you'll need that for the field and don't forget to take your farm information booklets to help you to uh, to train the farmer. Farmers all have those farm information booklets, but uh, bring your own one as well. So the first part of the scorecard in the field, um, don't forget to fill this out before you go to question one. The date, um, your name, um, the farmer um, and the farmer herd number. The field name, now the field name or number that could, I mean, you can go and you can just put in field one, two, three, four, whatever you want. Or um, do what would be really helpful for you is if you put in the field name according to how the farmer calls the field, if he calls it top field or bottom field or whatever he calls it. Just so that, you know, if you're talking to the farmer on the phone afterwards and you're referring to uh, a score or management or of a specific field, it, it, it's not really going to help if you're saying well, it's field one, whereas if you, if you say it's top field, then, then you both know what you're talking about. Um, that the first thing that you do then after that, before you go into question one, is you log on to the AgriSnap and, and you take a photo of the field, ensuring that the location is updated on the phone prior to taking a photograph. 
So um, just that we spoke about um, in the earlier talk on um, AgriSnap, that um, the things that were needed to go into the application and that each photo needs uh, a label and that there are a few photographs required um, per field. Now, for this part of the, the scorecard, for the field itself, for, um, for low input grassland, well, in total, for low input grassland, I'll tell you the, the total photos that are needed are you need a photo of the field. When you go into the field, you need a photo of the field. If then that field is being claimed for a late meadow bonus payment of 50 euro per hectare, um, you will need a geotagged photograph of the meadow either on the day that it's been cut or within five days of it being mown for every snap as well um, to claim that uh, 50 euro per hectare for the late meadow payment. That's two. Then for margins in the field, so if a field had four margins, you, four fence margins that the farmer put in. You don't need to take four photographs if each of those margins is, for example, two meters wide. But if he has two margins and one of them is one meter wide and one of them is three meters wide, you would take a photo of each margin width per field. So it, it might only be one per field, or it could be you might need a couple per field, depending on how many different types of margins that they've got in the field. And um, the last uh, part then is um, a photograph of the boundary condition, only for stone walls and hedgerows, and only for stone walls and hedgerows in condition um, A or B. But we'll talk about that later, so don't worry. But this is um, how not to take a photo for every snap of the field. There's too much sky. These are how not to take a photo for every snap of the field, looking at your feet or um, bending down to take a photograph, which just shows that the, the near vegetation, it's, it's not suitable either. And uh, this is appropriate. So it shows a roughly a quarter sky and take from a central field position um, and showing the central represent, uh, representative area of the field. So now we're ready for question one on the scorecard. How many positive indicator species are present? And there's a list um, there of, um, I don't know, it's 30, it's in the early 30s number of plants. And you can see there's high quality positive indicators there for the last four. Now I just put those in as high quality positive indicators in the last four because um, that I could have left them with a the larger list and I only separated them out as to try to help you to so you're just to help to reduce the list a little bit if you like so you're not looking at uh, such a long list and uh, so that you know that like if unless you're you, you'll know yourself if you're in a nice grassland that you can look for these uh, additional species which are typically uh, a lot of them found on limestone areas but they're not going to be found in like uh, you know a medium um, species field really then um, so even though there's 30, 30 odd species there, you don't need to go find 30. I mean, you find 12 and that gives you the maximum score. Over 12 is the maximum score. So 13 is, um, will give you 20 marks in, in the field. And, um, you know, a, a lot of fields of semi-improved um, would be, can easily have um, bet between uh, five and uh, 13 species. That's quite easy. Another thing is that while you not, may not be that familiar with these species at the moment, that they're not as scary as as um, on the initial inspection because it can be it can be a little bit tricky. Like if you're trying to if you're trying to identify plants down to species level, but at most of these, there's only a handful of plants in this list that are actual species by themselves. For example, yellow rattle or oxide daisy wild thyme but um the rest are all are all groups of species so that makes them much much easier to be able to to identify that um you know you can tell fairly readily by looking at a picture or a short description what that plant is without having to to read detailed wordy keys and wondering about um like small um diagnostic characteristics but what do you do if you go into a meadow then that's uh, cut before the assessment well that will happen, I suppose, but uh, we, you can advise the farmer now not to cut the meadow 
uh, before you go out and assess the field because it will make it very difficult for you to assess the field um, if they do. And um, the only place that you will have to be able to look for the indicator species is in the field margins and headlines. And uh, next year, um, um, that the, the assessments will have to be done before mowing for this reason. So to help you to look for those, um, those um, indicator species, we've published this plant identification key. This is what it looks like, and you may have seen it online. It's there now, and you'll all have a copy next week. So this is just to show you what it looks like. It's, um, I think it's A5 size, um, ring-bound notebook, and you to take it with you into the field each time you go in. So this is the inside pages then at the start of the book, what it looks like, how to use it. So there's four sections, positive indicators, negative indicators, uh, sown legumes and herbs. So for the multi-species lay, um, there, they've got uh, 12 um, commonly sown species there and invasive alien species, which is four of those at the back of the book. And the pages are, are colour coded, so they'll be green lined against the, the positive indicator species. Then each section is arranged by flower colour with red flowers first, yellow and white and green, and then um, the, um, I don't know whether the blues or pinks and purples are the last. And the flowering times for each group are shown as well in a calendar as they are uh, down here, at, um, it's, uh, June and July uh, shaded. Um, so, so read the description for each as, as well as looking at the photograph and, and um, other features and uh, look at the leaves as well. Um, some plants, not all plants, are going to be in flower at the same time, so looking at the leaves is, is, is going to help you. There's also a key at the start of the book, which um, this will be across four pages at the introduction of the book, um, pages five to nine, and it may help you. Um, that's the plants are arranged here by the colour too, um, but the way that this works is normally with a key um, that you know you're reading descriptions and um, you're deciding whether it matches this this set of characteristics best or the next set of characteristics best and going on from there. But the, this is more simpler than that. All you're doing is you're looking at the pictures. So um, you go to the the colour. So um, a, a white um, a white and green flower. Um, hogweed and uh, you, so the, the flower looks like that it looks like an umbrella for okay well, then next thing you look at the leaf shape and the leaf shape matches up with hogweed okay go to page 26 and the same for marsh pennywort the flower is very is not very conspicuous with marsh pennywort but the leaf um, you'll all know the leaf it's around around fleshy leaf on the ground there's nothing else it can be only marsh pennywort also in the book that all of the flowers are, um, the plants are arranged in the same order as they are on the scorecard. And this is the layout of the inside of the book, same species that we uh, mentioned twice already. In, um, it's in flower um, June, July and August. It's not, I don't think it's in flower yet. It's not this week anyway. And a short description there. And um, so you can see sort of the plant's growth habit. You can also see a close up of the flower and a close up of the leaf. So things, some things to try to help you um, when you go into a field, where to look for plants when you go into a field. Uh, wet areas, wet areas are always good for biodiversity. Their um, wet areas are typically higher in all nature value, um, generally. That's uh, the general rule, really. And areas with a lower uh, density of grass vegetation, so that you're not going to um, a part of the field where that, that's um, that some really lush grass growth because you won't find the indicator species there. But you can find some extra species at the, spe at, at the field edges. So for example, let's say that you had eight species in, in a field and five to eight species gets you a score of 10. But you know that if you get to nine species, you'll get a score of 15 for question one. So it's always worth then having a look around the edges and um, the margins to try to find an additional species to, to get uh, an extra five marks for that question. So don't be looking in thick grass or in bare patches beside the track or gateways. I'll show you photographs now. So um, this is an example of um, a place where you would look for, for species where I would head to in the field and places not to look. So um, 
yes, you will see in the bare patches, bare patches, bare ground attracts weeds, we all know. And some of you are probably thinking, well, um, isn't that what we're looking for? We're looking for weeds. Um, no, um, weeds are opportuni opportunistic plants that take advantage of, of um, any space or um, of, um, any space or competitive advantage where they can uh, take root and complete the life cycle life cycle really really quickly and uh, so you know, typically you find lots of weeds around gateways and bare muddy areas uh, like pineapple weed or chickweed and uh, different plants like that but your positive indicator species are not going to be in those areas and your positive indicator species um, they'll be harder to they'll be, they'll be less frequently come across um, if you go to these lush grass areas which could be could just the edge of a field or could be a place where the cattle are lying down or the trees but it's best to walk a w shaped um, walk across the entire field so they are capturing capturing all variation in um, vegetation types as you walk across the field and if you look at an aerial image of the field before you go out on your aerial map um, that, that will help direct you. you. You look at that and you see different colours in the field and if you see different colours in the field, well, that alerts you that there's different things going on and there's, um, there's more to look at. So, um, rather than showing you every indicator species and bamboozling you with, uh, with in, in, information, it's thought to be easier to show you what aren't indicator species. So uh, buttercups, um, there's no buttercup. There's like, I don't know how many different species of buttercup there are in Ireland. It's, it's uh, certainly a handful. And uh, daisies, neither of these are indicator species. Oxide daisy is an indicator species. And oxide daisy is a tall, um, dog daisies they're called. It's the tall, um, big daisy. Um, and it's got leaves um, all the way up the stem. And a very tall plant. Um, nor are these uh, positive indicator species. So speedwells is just a small blue flower. So if you see small blue flowers anywhere, and you might see some small blue flowers like inside of um, woody patches and gates, etc., like chickweed and, and 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 those other plants, you might see some there. But there is a there is a small blue plant that is a positive indicator species, and it's got yellow in the centre, and that's forget me not. So unless it's got a yellow centre. It's not a forget-me-not, and it's not a forget-me-not. This small blue plant is not going to be an indicator species. Rootwork plantain, lots of leaves of this in semi-improved uh, grassland. Um, it can be quite abundant. Um, it, 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 is, it, it, it is one of the plants in the sown um, multi-species lays, but it's not a positive indicator species for the low-impact grassland scorecard. Chickweed is not a positive indicator species, but um, it can easily fool you um, because the, this white uh, little flower here is um, looks very like um, some indicator species. Uh, but that's why it's important to look at the leaves too, not just the flowers. So this is a positive indicator. This is le lesser uh, stitchwort. Just any stitchwort species is a positive indicator. But if you look at the leaf on that, you can see it's a long, tapered, narrow uh, leaf there. So it's quite different from the previous. And lastly, the that isn't to be confused with um, with this, which is uh, mouse-eared chickweed, which is a small uh, little plant. And this is going to be in every field. I think this is probably been most um, most improved fields. It's in um, unimproved fields too, but it's it's in it's 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 in. I mean, this is the species that you'd be most likely come across before any other. This be in pretty much every field that you go to, I think. So it's got small um, leaves and they look like mouse mice ears. So that's why it's called mouse ear chickweed, and they're hairy, um, and the leaves are opposite each other. I'll I'll show it again at the end. Then some, some tools that can help you then um, for plant identification, as well as using this plant identification key book that you've got, is that uh, these are automatic image um, apps. I'm not going to go through them. Um, but that first one, PlantNet, I downloaded that um, in preparation for this talk just to see how it worked. And at the bottom, so it's the first thing listed, but it's also the last thing listed on this slide. And it says it only allows you five analyses per week, which I downloaded it before I realized that. But 
it, it doesn't. I think that it um, by by it's all these are free, but by by signing up to say I wanted to be part of the plant net, which is also free, it allows me much more than that. But what I did with the plant net was I had some photos of flowers already on my phone. So I just put them through the plant net and I got really high like um, straight away. Oh, yeah, that this is 70 percent um, sure, 76 percent sure that this is common sorrow, for example. So. Um, but just a, 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 another tip is that any botanist, right, whether you're a complete beginner or whether you're the most expert botanist in Ireland, every single one looks at, they don't just look at one resource to help them to identify a, 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 a plant. Um, if they're trying to figure out what a, what a plant is, you can get a really, really, really good idea from looking at, at one um Thing. But just because you go to PlantNet and, or one of these and it says, oh, well, it's 50 percent sure it's this. Just don't take that as, as gospel that that's what that's that what that plant is. Obviously, the higher the percentage, the more likely it is what it is, what you think it is. Another um, means then is um, identification by experts and community feedback. And I, I signed up to these two pages in uh, Facebook this week as well, just to see how active they are. The um, Irish Plant Identification Forum and the Wildflowers of Britain and Ireland, and they seem to be excellent that there's um, people are constantly uh, taking photographs. It's the right time of the year, I suppose. Lots of plants are coming into flower at the moment. and uh, People are taking lots and lots of photographs, submitting them to the Facebook page and uh, receiving um, answers from from uh, people that, um, you know, more experienced botanists straight away. So it's, they're really good uh, resources to use. And there's other ones there as well, besides Facebook. And some useful websites to use um, is uh, irishwildflowers.ie. You can search by habitat and by color, by what's flowering now. It's really, really easy, that one. I like it a lot. Uh, BSBI. Um, .org.uk is incredibly useful. A lot of very, very useful resources there, uh, particularly if you want to, if you're interested in botany and want to get to know a bit more about it. And then uh, botanicalkeys.co.uk is useful as well. If you want to try to enter some features that you've seen in the plant and you're not entirely sure what it is, that, that it will um, provide, it'll provide answers for you there too. And then there are some botany field guide books uh, that you can use. Um, so yeah, we'll leave this. These the presentation will be available for you to see that you can use it as, as reference. Now um, the two in the middle, um, the harrops and um, the other one, the white one, which I'm sorry, it's not very clear to to any of us who wrote that that they're meant to be the best for for beginners. Um, but I I don't have either of those. I've got the other three, and and but they're all um, really highly recommended. They're um, excellent books to use. And this is one more. It's um, this has just been published. I think just this week. It's a new edition of the Wildflowers of Ireland. It's a book edition of the website that I said to you was very very useful, uh, written by Zoe Devlin. So um, moving on to question two, what is the combined cover of positive indicators throughout the field? So it's um, these cover questions can be tricky, um, especially if you're trying to look at percentages. And I mean, it's very subjective if you're doing that and you're trying to say, well, has it got, you know, are the positive indicators are 20% or are the 25% and how do you know? Um, but rather than looking at percentages, these descriptions are really, really, really helpful, um, and this is what what I uh, would really recommend to use. Um, so these are written on the guidance sheet on the back of the scorecard. So if it's negligible, it'll be a few scattered individuals or very small patches in the field, and the entire sward appears grassy. Grassy. Um, the next one, if it's six to ten percent, is low. It means that it's still very, very grassly and um, that the positive indicators only occur in small patches. They're very scattered. You have to, you have to search for them in the field again. And um, medium, uh, 11 to 20 percent, the, the sword still looks grassy, but you encounter a positive indicator every couple of steps. So that's really useful, that every couple of steps rather than going for the 11 to 20 percent. And the next category is high. And um, yeah, you can see positive, you can see different colours or whatever across the field. 
And then most yellow grassy buds got frequent in, interspersed flowers, yellow and pink flowers, and you encounter a positive indicator species with every step that you take. And then uh, it's, uh, if it's very high, then you're, you're encountering multiple positive indicators with every step and in between steps too. Uh, um, this, is, uh, this is a really, really important point. So that this combined cover of positive indicators throughout the field, and what I've described there about how you estimate cover of positive indicators, that's how you estimate the cover of positive indicators. There's three cover questions on the scorecard. There's also estimating the cover of negative indicators, and there's estimating the cover of negative indicators in field margins and boundaries, and there's different criteria that you use for that. So you need to refer to this guidance each time. Uh, you know, even even me who can like who knows all these species and um, you know, has lots of um, experience with with results based um, scoring of grasslands, that I, I would refer to the guidance for the cover questions. Um, question three: What is the vegetation structure or litter level? So it's like, is the field, um, you know, undergrazed or overgrazed? So if it's in poor condition, um, it's very much under the farmer's control. It's it's either very short or very tall, or if it's um, if it hasn't been grazed at all, it could be high litter levels in it, greater than fifty percent. If it's moderate then there isn't a great diversity of, of sward structure in the field. Or litter, it could be still, um, if it's undergrazed, it could be quite high litter levels in there too, just not as high as the previous category. And if it's in good, um, good will then there be um, a mixture of tall, medium and short vegetation throughout the field and low litter levels. Uh, for um, a meadow that's hay or, hay or silage meadow, it's either been closed off uh, or it's been recently mown that you can assume good structure in those scenarios. Uh, quick examples of undergrazing, which is easily rectified uh, for next year. The coarse grasses, uh, scrub and undesirable weeds in the first photo and would benefit, of course, from some light summer and autumn grazing and some really undergrazed wet grassland um, and if it's suitable to, to handle to uh, if some um, some cattle grazing, some autumn cattle grazing would help there. And uh, an example of um, overgrazing. Some signs of undergrazing would be low numbers of different plants, um, uh, scrubs spreading to areas that are in good condition, or um, many uh, taller plants and uh, dead plant material. Um, signs of overgrazing, poaching, um, again, low numbers of plant species, a few flowers during the, the spring and summer. And uh, if there's any damage uh, from animals uh, rubbing up against uh, field boundary trees and shrubs, uh, boundary features. Just, um, you know, the scrub is not necessarily a bad uh, feature in these fields that, um, you know, that there is a, a tolerance for an amount of scrub up to, to 10%. So there'd have to be quite a lot of scrub encroaching into the field um, for it to, to, to come, come over that. If a field is being grazed and if it's been managed, it's not really going to, to, um, to hit that category uh, of, um, of, of scrub being an issue. So what's the combined cover of negative indicators throughout the field? And you tick these are present. And the negative indicators include dry grass, so there's ryegrass, docks, uh, ragwort, nettles, bracken, um, creeping and spear thistle, or any other plant. If there's another plant, then you write in there what it is. And to estimate the cover in this, read the descriptions here again. So it'd be um, very visible in this ward for very high, occurring in dense patches or abundance throughout the field. If it's high, it occurs in medium to large patches in the field, and it's not limited to previous breeding sites, trackways, boundaries, and it's readily visible in this ward. Medium occurring in several small to medium sized patches um, throughout the field and around tra um, trackways and boundaries, gateways, etc. Or if it's low, if it's present in scattered or small clumps of weeds only. And, um, uh, it, it, you know, the, 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 it's, it's normal, I suppose, usual to find them around um, because of our weather conditions, I suppose, around gateways and feed trucks. But, but this cover should be less than 10% and the weeds not. Um, so if it's less than 10%, there's no impact on, on the farmer's score there. It has to be above 11%, 11 to 30% for the farmer to get a minus five score there. 
Field margins, I'm not going into any detail here, but it's just about gone through questions one, two, three, and four. So the next uh, three questions, um, five, six, and seven, I'm not um, just, I'm just uh, telling you what they are. Um, and if you've got your scorecard in front of you, you'll see it anyway, that, uh, that you mark on the map, all fence field margins present and their widths, whether they're one, two or three metres wide. The margins have to be fenced unless a combined score of 35 is achieved in questions one or two. And five bonus marks be awarded for any field margin beside a water course. Um, a water course in REAP doesn't mean a have to be in a natural water course, that we are um, rewarding any water course, whether it's a natural water course or a drainage ditch. That drainage ditch may not even contain water on the day of assessment. We're assuming that it contains water at some time of the year. So those five bonus points to be awarded for any field margin beside any uh, natural water course or wet or dry drainage, uh, drainage ditch. Obviously, if it's a drainage ditch and it's completely, completely overgrown with vegetation, and it's obvious that there's never any water, in, that's, that's not included. Question six and seven, mark on the map all field boundary features. Um, so that includes earth banks, drainage ditches, post and wire and rail fences, water courses, hedgerows, tree lines, dry stone walls and, and other features. And the only ones that are being condition assessed are hedgerow and stone wall and they've been condition assessed by marking on the map A, B or C. Um, GLAMS does the rest for you. GLAMS calculates the density of these features per hectare and gives you the mark for this question. GLAMS gives you the mark for the mar margins question too. Uh, question seven, what's the combined cover of negative indicator species throughout the field margins and uh, boundaries? And similar to the previous cover questions, but I'll go into that tomorrow. Um, the second last question on the card, to what extent is the field poached? So it's reasonable to assume an, um, a small amount of, of poaching with tolerance for that. So there's no, um, there's no impact on a farmer score unless the field is poached um, above 10% of the area of the field. And there's descriptions there in to, um, to tell you how high those levels of poaching are. So um, very high, but extensive damage across most of the field and really extensive rutting and compaction from machinery. And the next category would be disturbance around water sources would extend for over three metres and extensive areas of bare ground noticeable, not confined to regularly used routes and can be a medium extent of rutting and compaction from machinery. Um, medium to low would be uh, soil disturbance around water features extending not more than three metres, one to three metres. And, um, and then low, there'd be little impact on the field. You might have small patches of bare ground, you know, along well used trackways or gates and small areas of poaching um, as a whole. But the grassland as a whole be well vegetation in summer and there's no, uh, there's no poaching or dunging at wet features. Um, the last question then, is there any evidence of damaging activities to, to soil, vegetation or water? And um, to tick which of those are present. So things like bare soil and erosion, any damage to water courses that could be from livestock or vehicle or access, inappropriate use of herbicide or inappropriate use of um, fertilizer, burning, dumping or littering, or evidence that uh, field boundaries have been removed or if they're damaged by machinery or any extensive areas of bare or disturbed ground or anything else going on in the field, there's space for you to describe what that is there as well. Um, if there's no damaging activities, then th th there's no score in the field. The tolerances for this are low because, of course, like, uh, you know, if a farmer is applying something like MCPA along side a, uh, a drainage ditch in the field well, that could be only occurring on two percent or three percent of the area of the field but it's having a very significant impact on water quality uh, downstream so it's it's only fair that uh, that uh, marks are taken from it in that situation and this all of these marks are entirely at the discretion of the farmer so some examples then of damaging activities are just, just uh, some dumping in the field and um, some poaching along um, through the middle of the field from vehicles. This is um, no buffer zone being used in a field beside a water course and uh, some, um, some uh, poaching um, going down into the water course itself. Um, some other minor examples and it's 
very hard to tell from looking at a photograph because these could be really minor or they could be significant. So it's um, it depends, I suppose, on whether they're they're affecting a watercourse or not. So if this, you know, if you just see a little bit of damage like this in the field, it's not, it may not be significant. However, if you see some damage like this, where there's obvious sedimentation and that sedimentation is running straight into a watercourse, well then it is an issue. Then for each field, there's a management advice um, section. Um, and in GLAMS that you will be, GLAMS will make you uh, tick at least one of these um, management advice options for each field and it's really useful because well it helps to provide um, feedback to the farmer um, about what's good and what's wrong and it also helps jolt your memory if you're if you're scoring a few fields in one day that um, you'll know uh, what the issue was or what the you know how good a certain field was by by taking one of these uh, so there's things like continuing extensive management of this, this high quality grassland controlling the occurrence and spread of invasive species controlling the spread of encroaching scrub and so on uh, consider a late cut uh, meadow um, late cut meadow in year two for a bonus payment I and mean, that might be a good idea to advise that to the farmer if if they're interested in that and then some advice for the boundary or margin in, on the right hand side and also if the farmer wants to take up any complementary actions in that field um, that you would mark those locations on the map and uh, tick these box whether it's uh, tree planting new hedgerow planting or hedgerow infilling of gaps and uh, these this management advice as well will be um, when when we print a PDF from GLAMS, which shows the overall result of that field, the score for that field, and it shows the completed scorecard for that field. It'll also show the management advice, so that will be given to the, the farmer, so it'll be um, automatically able to, to see uh, what, you know, what we're looking for and how to increase the score. That's at the end. Um, that's, um, again, just, um, me banging on about this one species uh, mouse here in every single field you come to not a positive indicator species. Thank you.